Okay, today I want to talk a little bit about the history of chemistry, and the history of chemistry I think is one of the uh, most fascinating things about it, because if you learn a little bit about the history of chemistry, then you can kind of figure out uh, the trail, uh, if you will, of how different discoveries came about and how the science really developed. And it really started with a field called alchemy. But before we get into alchemy, I want to introduce you to a guy named Democritus. Democritus was an ancient Greek, and it's spelled like this. He was working with uh, his teacher's name was Leucippus, who I like to just mention because he's such an interesting um, character. He and Democritus both believed in what was called what they termed atomos. Atomos. And atomos in Greek, and this should actually be two words, you can't really see that very well, atomos being two separate words, means not cut or indivisible. And the context of this, the reason that I'm even talking about it is it kind of looks like our modern word for atoms. And atoms really first were conceptualized by Democritus and Leucippus, and they said, well, everything is made up of these tiny individual units, and these tiny individual units we call atomos, because we can't cut them down further, they are indivisible. But what they thought of as atoms is very different than the way that we think about atoms. They thought that atoms had individual pieces of matter, right, which is sort of the way that we think about them today, but that that individual piece was unique to that particular um, object. So for instance, if I have this pen, this pen is made up of pen atoms, pen atomos, and these pen atoms are going to give this pen its different characteristics. So maybe the pen atoms, for this one in particular, are black and also they are wet, right? So they have characteristics of the thing themselves, right? Because it's a wet erase marker and it's a black color, right? So there's something about the individual particles that make up matter, these atomos, that give to the object its overall characteristics as a whole. That's what Democritus thought. Again, a little bit different than the way that we think about them now, and we'll kind of talk about how that evolved. Um, kind of today and in the course of this quarter. Now, the one who really formalized the idea of atoms in the way that we think about atoms is John Dalton. And if you look at the years here, Democritus was around in 460 to 370 before the Common Era, BCE, and John Dalton was around in the 1700s and early 1800s. So that's uh, over 2,000 years between when we first came up with the idea of atoms and when we first formalized a scientific theory on them. So that's a really long time. So in between coming up with atoms and formalizing a theory, someone came along and derailed science, derailed chemistry. And that person, we'll get back to John Dalton here, that person was Aristotle. And Aristotle, who was around just after Democritus here, is a famous philosopher, and Democritus was at the same time. Most scientists were also philosophers, or you could say that most philosophers were early scientists, if you wanted to think about it that way. And Aristotle believed not in atoms, but in four elements that made up all of matter. And this is called elemental theory. And these four elements are going to be ones that are pretty familiar to you. They're earth, air or wind, fire, and water. So what Aristotle believed is that everything is made up of these four elements, some combination of earth, air, fire, and water, and that we could change the composition of something. I could add a little more water, I could take away a little air, I could add a little fire, and that would change one thing into another, okay? So by changing the composition, you could change what the object is. And this is really important moving forward. 
Now, just like with Democritus, Aristotle also believed that these four elements would give characteristics to the things that they were part of. So for instance, if we're talking about my car, I drive a Volvo. If we're talking about the seats in my Volvo, then maybe they're made up of a little bit of earth, right? Because they're nice and um, grounded, right? <laughs> and at the same time, they're very comfy and cushy. They have to be because of my commute. And so they probably have a little bit of air in there also. So they're made up of some combination of earth and air. And if I wanted to change that something about them, let's say I wanted to make them heated seats, then I'd have to add a little bit of fire to them, right? Or if I wanted to have them have cooling action, then I'd maybe have to add a little water or take away a little fire or something. So the idea is that you could change the composition of the elements that make things up and you change what the object is. Now this is an important idea because this really led to alchemy. And alchemy is really early chemistry, uh, and that's why we call it alchemy. Uh, it means kind of leading up to the chemical process. We're still studying chemicals, but sort of for different goals and different reasons than why we study chemistry today. Um, the alchemists were interested in kind of two goals. They first wanted to turn base metals into gold. So sometimes you'll think about alchemists as changing lead into gold. That's kind of what we mean here. So literally making something gold that wasn't gold before. And the second goal was in making an immortality potion. So finding something that would give immortality to these folks, okay? And there were a couple different ways that they wanted to go about doing this. And so the alchemists really led to the modern chemists in a couple of different ways. But what they were ultimately trying to find was something called the Philosopher's Stone. And the alchemists believed that the Philosopher's Stone could do both of those things. So if they had this philosopher's stone, and it wasn't necessarily like an actual physical stone, this was kind of somewhat metaphorical, somewhat poetic almost, um, that there's this substance that can turn uh, things into gold and that will convey upon its user immortality, this philo philosopher's stone. And alchemists have been in literature for a long time. For instance, if you read the Harry Potter books, or if you've seen the Harry Potter movie, the very first Harry Potter book in the US is called Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. But JK Rowling, the uh, author of Harry Potter, is British. And the UK version, so if you were to buy the first Harry Potter book in the United Kingdom, it's Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone, because that's what Voldemort was after. He was looking after a way to regain his body, right? He was just a spirit, and so he was looking for the Philosopher's Stone, and he was studying that famous alchemist, and they were looking for him in the library. They looked for the books in the library, etc. So um, you'll find alchemy in modern literature. And the Philosopher's Stone does come up in a lot of different contexts. And what ultimately they were trying to do was to make this thing, to make the Philosopher's Stone. And so in doing this, they did a couple things that led to modern chemistry. So this is kind of the how. And I apologize if I go off track in this lecture a little bit. I kind of love this topic, so um, it happens. So there's a couple ways that alchemy leads to modern chemistry. And the first is that they take really good lab notes. Now you not, may not think much of that because you've been taking science classes now and you've had to probably take good lab notes as you're doing experiments and that kind of thing. But this was a relatively unheard of thing, um, at least at the time, and especially with the way that they did it, because alchemists were very secretive. They didn't want other people to learn the, the secrets of the Philosopher's Stone and the secrets of alchemy. And so they would write all of their lab notebooks and all their data down in code. <laughs> 
and they had different symbols that represented the chemical elements. And so this idea of symbols representing elements was kind of um, right off the bat. That was a, a something that led to modern chemistry. Because that's what we see on the modern periodic table as well. So symbols are representing our elements as well. They just aren't um, as creative or nice looking as some of the ones from the alchemists. Um, and this was also important because if the alchemists were to find something that would lead to immortality or were to find something that would uh, change lead into gold, for instance, then you'd want to make sure you could do it again, right? Repeatability was a big deal. So they were really, really careful um, to make sure that they could repeat their experiments. Now, there were a lot of charlatans, there were a lot of fakes around in this time, and some people claimed to be alchemists and claimed to be able to do things when they weren't able to. But the ones that were really trying to do science and really trying to figure out what was going on with matter and, um, and doing their experimentation uh, in a scientific way, not a pseudo-scientific way, but a scientific way, then they were really doing this. And this led to modern record keeping and also the way that we um, share data. Uh, these days. So the second thing that kind of led from alchemy to modern chemistry was the lab equipment. So some of these scientists, some of these early alchemists were doing science in a lab that had never been done before. So they needed to create their own lab equipment. And the way that they did things was very different as well from what we had seen before. So the lab equipment and exper experiments in general were new and they provided a foundation for the way that we would study matter as chemists later on. So they were in their search for this philosopher's stone really creating a science. Okay, and that led to people like Robert Boyle, for instance. We talked about Robert Boyle in the gas law video. Robert Boyle was the father of modern chemistry, but he really was an alchemist also. But what Robert Boyle, the thing that made Robert Boyle different than some of the other alchemists is he wanted people to be aware of what was going on. He wanted people to be able to repeat his lab experiments and to decipher his lab notes. So he spoke in very plain language in order for people to really understand. Now that kind of gets us to, <coughs> back to, John Dalton. John Dalton is the one that we talked about before. He's the father of modern atomic theory, and he was around in the 1700s. Uh, just as an aside, for those of you who are taking the class here, um, I'm never going to ask you for dates on an exam. I'm just giving them to you in terms of timeline, so you have some idea of, of historical timeline on this. But John Dalton then, in his study of matter, and John Dalton was coming around after chemistry had been somewhat solidified. Um, we really had moved from alchemy to chemistry at this point. And he was formalizing this theory of atoms. And so he said that everything is made up of atoms. Everything is made up of tiny particles that are called atoms. So he actually kept the term from Democritus. He kept the term atoms and he said everything is made up of these teeny tiny particles. It's not quite the same way that Democritus was talking about them, but he had the right idea. So we're going to call them what he called them, which are atomos or atoms, not cut or indivisible. And John Dalton said that all atoms for a given element are identical to each other. Okay, so if you have an atom of gold and I have an atom of gold, then those atoms of gold are going to be identical. And if I have an atom that doesn't look like your atom of gold, then my atom must be a different element, okay? He also said that each of the elements, each of the atoms for a given element, so different elements here, um, have different masses, 
Now this was really important because at the time that Dalton was figuring out this kind of theory of atoms, they still hadn't really agreed upon a way to organize the different elements that were known. So the periodic table of elements hadn't quite been formalized yet. Um, it was around the same time that John Dalton was living, but not quite yet. So he uh, gave the way, or a way, to organize the elements because he said, well, there's different elements that have different masses and every element is gonna have a distinct mass, a unique mass. So we could be able to organize them or tell them apart based on those masses. And that's also the way that he was able to do some experimentation, which was useful. The other thing that came out of this, and we'll get into this in more detail when we talk about chemical bonding, but he said that uh, when atoms combine together to form compounds, then they combine together in simple whole number ratios. simple whole number ratios. So it means that when atoms combine together, it's maybe two atoms of hydrogen to one atom of oxygen, for instance, that gives us water. Or I may have one atom that combines with one other atom, or I may have three atoms that combine with one atom, that kind of thing. So there's always simple whole number ratios for the way that atoms combine together to form compounds. And we'll get into that in more detail when we talk about chemical bonding, but this was an important piece to atomic theory. Okay, so that was John Dalton. So out of John Dalton's experiments and experience, then we ended up with basically a definition for atoms, right? And that's basically atomic theory. And so now in our class where we're at, um, we're going to be using the term atoms quite a bit. And we'll get into atoms in more detail when we get into chapter four. But atoms for right now, and we'll build on this definition as we go, are the fundamental unit of chemistry. Okay, so this isn't to say that they can't be broken down further like John Dalton was saying, because we know that they can. We know that atoms are made up of subatomic particles and now even smaller than that, um, sub-subatomic particles like quarks and muons and all sorts of crazy business. So, But for those of us in the chemistry field, atoms are really the fundamental unit which help us with our study of matter. We're looking at the study of the structure and behavior of matter as chemists, and so then these are our fundamental units to do that. Now another term that I'll be using, and this comes from John Dalton as well, is the idea of a molecule. So a molecule now kind of that last tenant of atomic theory says we can put them together in simple whole number ratios. When we put together more than one atom and we chemically bond them together, then we have a molecule. Okay, so now we have two definitions for the fundamental units and structure of matter, which is incredibly important. And so moving forward then, as we're talking about this, we're gonna talk about how these things are organized, okay, with our atoms and our molecules. And so we need to talk about one more personality. This is one of the guys that is in your textbook. His name is Antoine Lavoisier. Antoine Lavoisier, who was around a little bit prior to John Dalton, is also known as the father of chemistry. Chemistry as a discipline doesn't really mind sharing a bunch of credit around, <laughs> so I think that that's kind of a nice thing. Antoine Lavoisier, along with Robert Boyle, were really the fathers of modern chemistry, and there were some others along the way as well. Lavoisier was really important for a couple different reasons. Um, he really organized the way that we name chemical compounds. And the conventions that he gave us, we use still today. And we'll talk about that in the next chapter, in chapter three.
And Antoine Lavoisier also gave us a definition for element. An element, he basically said, is a fundamental unit in kind of a different way than the atom here. It's a fundamental unit that cannot be broken down and still retain its chemical characteristics. So an element is something that it's some sort of fundamental substance. We can't break it down any further and still have the same characteristics of that substance. So this kind of uh, builds on what we talked about with the atom too, because if atoms and elements are somewhat interchangeable in terms of fundamental units for chemistry, then we can break them down. They can get smaller, but when you break them down, then they no longer retain what makes them chemically interesting. So we as chemists care about things at the elemental or the atomic level or the molecular level because that's where the interesting chemistry is really going on. And so that's kind of a springboard for what we'll talk about next, which is the organizational um, components of the elements, which is the periodic table. So that's where we're headed. If you have any questions on any of this, don't hesitate to ask and I'll talk to you again soon.